invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. It is not my intention to give an exposition of uh, the passage that I'm about to read. I do hope to give an exposition tomorrow, but uh, not today. Instead, to preach a topical sermon uh, insofar as it is a sermon and uh, it can, it, it's going to come dangerously close to being a lecture. Uh, but the passage that I'm about to read is uh, very relevant to the topic that I'm going to address. When, uh, well, first of all, it's such a delight to be here. So good to see many of you that I have not seen for a long time and to uh, get reacquainted with you. So good to see you. This is the third time that I have spoken at a, at a Midwest Founders Conference. And I'm seeing a pattern here. Uh, the first year that I spoke, Chuck Todd had been asked to preach. And I think it was Chuck who brought me to the Founders Conference the first time back in about 1997, I think. And uh, I think the following year, Chuck was supposed to give a talk, but Instead, Chuck gave me his slot. He asked the, uh, uh, the organizers, is it okay if I give Jim Oreck my slot? And so I, uh, I spoke that year, I think, on uh, C.H. Spurgeon. You can still find that on uh, YouTube. People occasionally uh, go there and then tell me how young I looked in those days. <clears throat> and then uh, when I was pastoring in Kansas City, Jim Eliff had been asked to give a talk on the Lord's Supper. And I had recently preached on the Lord's Supper at the church where we were elders together. And uh, Jim contacted the organizers of the conference and said, you know, uh, Jim Oreck has got a really good sermon on this. Why don't you let Jim Oreck preach? So I was not really asked either time. And I was not the first choice this time either. <laughs> so at the last minute in November, Terry Coker calls me in something of a panic and asks me if I could possibly come and speak. And uh, so I'm delighted to be here under even, e any circumstances, even if I'm not your first date for prom, <laughs> your first choice for your prom date. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I will uh, give a few words of uh, explanation before I get into my main talk. The first one being, I don't intend to give a, an exposition of this passage of scripture, but let's read it in Revelation chapter three and verse one. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his, holy, before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I think that this letter that is written to the church in Sardis is a letter that could easily be written to uh, some, of, uh, some of the seminaries with which we have been familiar, some of the Southern Baptist uh, seminaries that we know and have loved. Uh, when, uh, when I went to uh, Mid-America Seminary, which was where I met Curtis McLean, uh, there was a professor there who was dearly loved, a man named uh, Reginald Barnard. He was an old man by the time we knew him, probably in his late 70s or 80s. And uh, I never went to Mid-America for the purpose of getting a degree. In fact, 
uh, my, my, my whole life, it seems like I have been tricked into getting education. Uh, I sometimes wonder what it would be like to have a conversation with my 12-year-old self and uh, how he would react if I would say, son, you're going to go to college for 15 years. I know he would sit down and cry. I never have liked school. I still don't. And uh, I went to college mostly to play basketball. And, uh, but then one thing led to another, and I ended up getting... Uh, not only a Bachelor of Arts degree, but then I thought maybe my wife and I would go to a, a closed country as missionaries, and so I got, I got a Master of Arts degree in teaching English as a second language, and then I found myself pastoring a small church in the hills of West Virginia that really couldn't give me a salary that would support the number of children that I was having, and uh, so I asked them, can I go to school and, and get qualified to do something to make money? And uh, so I thought if the Lord is going to continue to have me pastoring in small churches, I need to do something to uh, provide for my family. And so I went to Ohio University and got a Ph.D. in English literature. And then I wound up in Kansas City, and I was about two-thirds of the way towards an MDiv. And so the church said, well, if you want to get it, we'll pay for it. And so I thought, well, that's a deal I can't pass up. And I went ahead and took what few remaining classes there were. And so I never really meant to get a degree in anything. And uh, when I went to, to Mid-America, I had no intention of getting a, a degree from there. I was just taking classes that I was interested in and classes that I thought would help me uh, in my ministry. I had already been preaching for nearly 10 years when I went to Mid-America. I started when I was in my teens. And uh, preaching, not Mid-America. And so uh, at Mid-America, I, I knew that uh, Dr. Barnard was greatly respected, and so I took his contemporary theology class. And on the first day of class, Dr. Barnard said, I believe that theological education and academic degrees ought forever to be divorced on the basis of incompatibility. And I thought, that's exactly the way I feel about this. And uh, so time went on, and he, he assigned us a massive research project. And uh, I, uh, I went to Dr. Barnard, and I said, I, I just want you to know I'm not going to do that research project. I, I don't intend any disrespect by it. Uh, I, I, I just want to come and let you know. And he said, well, if you don't do the research project, you'll, you'll fail the class. And I said, that's all right. I still will have learned a lot. And he said, but if you don't have this class, then you'll never be able to graduate. I said, I seem to remember an old sage once saying that he thought that theological education and academic degrees ought forever to be divorced on the basis of incompatibility. And uh, he was not a very emotional man, but his shoulders rose a couple of times. It was about, it was about the most emotional I had ever seen him get. Uh, he said, you say an old sage told you that. So when I was, uh, was given the general theme of the conference that we're going to be talking about the gospel downgrade, and so uh, Pastor uh, Griever asked, what would you like to speak about? And uh, well, I, said, I would like to talk about how that there are, uh, there seems to be a persistent leftward movement from theological seminaries and theological schools. It seems like they always end up going liberal. And so I proposed the title, Divorced on the Basis of Incompatibility, and he softened it up to whatever it is that we have now. And uh, so uh, obviously I don't, I don't think that it is incompatible to love the gospel and love the Lord Jesus Christ and be uh, a, an astute, conscientious uh, pursuer of academia. So I think it's a, something of a disclaimer to say I'm not against getting degrees. I've got several of them. Uh, but I also am aware that having an academic degree does not mean that you're educated. Having an academic degree, especially if you've got a PhD, only says one thing for sure, and that is that you are capable of voluntarily sitting still while people torture you for long periods of time. <laughs> it does say that, but it does not necessarily say that, uh, that you are educated. Another disclaimer is that in the course of my uh, 
talking about the challenges that exist between the academy and maintaining a robust hold uh, and appreciation of the gospel is that uh, I, uh, throughout most of my life, since I was 17 years old, years old, I have been a preacher of the gospel. I've always considered that that is my first, that is my first calling. That's what I have always been most interested in. But because of some of the academic achievements that I got along the way, then I also have had the opportunity to teach at several colleges and universities and for 18 years was a full-time employee at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I taught in the undergraduate school at Boyce College. I was, uh, I was fired from that position in the spring of 2020, so almost two years ago, under the auspices of budget cuts that were made because of COVID. Now, later that year, they hired, uh, they hired new people to replace the people that they had fired that year. And so I don't think that that was really the reason. And there are a number of other things that lead me to conclude that uh, I really was not let go because of COVID. I believe that I was let go because I spoke against some of the, some of the concerns that I am going to talk to you about today and tomorrow. And I have prayed about this and I've prayed, Lord, help me to be as gentle and kind and gentlemanly as I can, but help me not to be so vague that I don't do anybody any good. And so may the Lord hear that prayer and uh, hear my statement of it as a prayer for his help that I might do that again. But uh, recently at my church, where I'm pastor, the Bullet Lick Baptist Church, the church name that makes all other Baptist pastors turn pale with envy. I, I appointed a committee to ask how are we going to continue our support of the cooperative program. The, the people at the Bullet Lick Baptist Church are very generous givers and we give a significant portion of our income to the cooperative program, but we're, we are unhappy with the way some of the things are going in the seminaries and North American Mission Board uh, the International Mission Board, Lifeway, and, uh, and so I appointed a committee. At the, at the business meeting where this uh, committee was approved, someone asked, why aren't you on the committee? And I gave a couple of reasons. I said, well, I, I've got some blood in this game, and I don't want to get in the flesh about it. I think that it would be better if I stayed on the outside. And then another thing is that it interferes with the spirit of prayer. I just... I just can't, I can't cope with controversy very well. And so I suppose that what I'm getting ready to say today is inevitably going to be controversial. And, uh, but uh, if nobody says, if good men do nothing, if good men say nothing, then evil will prevail. And so uh, may the Lord give us wisdom as I, as I speak and as you listen to repeated challenges that face theological institutions as uh, embracing the gospel or rejecting the gospel. Now I'm going to divide this talk into three segments. So the first segment has to do with ideas. And I think that there are two or three ideas that present ongoing challenges in the effort for theological institutions to remain gospel-loving institutions. And then I'm going to say, as a result of these ideas, it affects the personnel who are chosen to administrate the seminary, people who are chosen to teach there, and it affects the students who go there. And then I plan to end up this talk with a word about uh, churches and our responsibility, especially in the Southern Baptist Convention, to take advantage of the fact that uh, the seminaries belong to us and that they are supposed to listen to what the churches say. So let's first of all think about some of the ideas that I think are especially destructive in uh, theological institutions. And the first one is people at theological institutions want to have the approval of the world. They want to have the approval of the world. And this shows up in a couple of ways. One way is overt. 
There's something that theological institutions usually are very upfront about in seeking the approval of the world. And then another is covert, something that is uh, unspoken. It's not written down. The overt problem is that most of our theological institutions seek accreditation from a secular accrediting association. You got a problem right there. It is we want people who do not love Jesus and people who do not know the Bible, we want them to approve the education that we are offering here. Now, uh, I believe that it's possible to negotiate that and to uh, hold firmly to the, the Word of God and to hold firmly to the Gospel and at the same time satisfy the demands of the accrediting institution. Uh, but I fear that uh, sometimes the effort to please the accrediting institution causes us to make some compromises uh, regarding issues that the accrediting institution will find offensive. And the accrediting institution will uh, have some ideals that they would like the institution to pursue uh, in hiring and uh, matters of diversity and inclusion and so on. And, uh, and so on. I'll say more about that when I get to the part about personnel. So an overt problem is we want to have the approval of people who do not love Jesus and people who do not believe the Bible. This is a little bit like uh, going into your surgeon's office before you have surgery and seeing on his wall a certificate of approval from an electrician's union or from a plumber's union. It's like, well... Maybe they are able to recognize business excellence. Maybe they'll recognize something, but they have, they have no knowledge to be able to tell whether or not you are a good surgeon. I remember when I was uh, talking to people about going to Mid-America Seminary back in 1986. Mid-America was fairly young then and fairly unheard of. The, the Southern Baptist schools were in a, a, a quagmire of liberalism in those days. And if you wanted to go to a place where they believed the Bible, then Mid-America was one of your few Baptist options. So I went to Mid-America, and when I told people that's where I was going, they asked, is it accredited? And I wanted to ask, and I may have asked, accredited by whom? Accredited by people who don't know God? What do I care about that? Is it accredited by God? That's what I want. I want to know, do the, 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 the boys who come out of this school, do they hold to the Bible? Do they preach the Bible? Can they preach? Can they pastor? Are they prepared to do the work of the Lord? That's the accreditation we want. Asking in a, a secular accrediting association to approve of what we're doing is a little bit like appointing someone who is really good at playing basketball to be a political commentator. What does he know about politics? What makes him an authority? But of course we do that sort of thing all the time. We ask someone who is a, a great athlete or someone who is a movie star, or someone who is a talented singer, what they think about political, what they think about political issues. We find that ridiculous, I hope. But I think it's the same sort of thing as when we are seeking overtly the approval of the world by asking them to approve what they think is foolishness. Because, you know, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And the natural man thinks that they are foolish. So, that is an overt courting of the approval of the word. A covert courting of the approval of the world, I meant to say, the covert uh, seeking the approval of the world is when we start embracing worldly philosophies in order that they will think that we're pretty cool. Now, it's under the auspices of the idea that if they don't think that you're a total idiot, then they might listen to the gospel. Uh, that's the best construction that I can put on it. But I'm afraid that there is uh, perhaps a more accurate description 
and that is that a lot of professional academics in the theological arena get kind of tired of the Sunday school stuff. They get kind of tired of the, 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 old, the old, old story. And, uh, and they're always looking for something new. And there are theological controversies that sweep through seminaries that, thank God, the average person in the pew never even hears of. But there's just this, this obsession with, here's something new. It was about three years ago, it hasn't been long, three or four years ago that I was uh, standing, uh, on, I was still on faculty at that time, I was standing in line getting ready to uh, process for the day of graduation and, and uh, I was talking to uh, someone on the police force uh, who was uh, very concerned about the movement in the faculty and administration towards critical race theory and towards uh, social justice, embracing the social justice movement. And uh, a, a colleague of mine walked by behind me and this police officer said to me, that one is really woke. And I said, what does that mean? This was, this was probably in 2018. I didn't, know what, I didn't know what the word woke meant. And people were proudly uh, saying that they were woke. They were uh, endorsing books that talked about the importance of being a woke Christian and uh, on, on, uh, on the administration. Now, I, I, I've asked myself, should I just say on the administration of Southern there was this guy and that guy? but probably 85% of you have seen the videos that I'm going to mention. So at that time, Matthew Hall was going great guns on how he's going to peel back the layers of alleged orthodoxy and reveal the rotting corpse of white supremacy. And he was sitting on panels where they were uh, openly espousing critical race theory, where they were openly criticizing the police, bringing in speakers that were no doubt about it, in favor of critical race theory. And, um, and he was commended by some of the people on the panels. Wow, Dr. Hall really knows a lot about critical race theory. He's, he's done his homework and so on. And that would have been the right time for Matthew Hall to say, hold on, I don't believe in critical race theory. But at that time, it was cool to hold on to critical race theory. At that time, it was cool to say that you were woke. Since that time, let's be fair, he has said, I don't hold to critical race theory. There were others on faculty who at one time, uh, you know, would have said so. I was in a faculty meeting one time when three of these guys got up and started crying about how misunderstood they were. And the writing, the handwriting on, was already on the wall for me. And I already made up my mind, if possible, I'm going to keep a low profile and keep my job here if I can. It has become clear to me by this time that, that Dr. Moeller does not want me or anybody else who disagrees with him to give our opinion on the way that we think, think things are. And so I determined at this point, I'm just not going to say anything. So these three guys get up and they start whining about how misunderstood they are. And if I, if I was going to say anything, this is what I would have said. If you guys would just stop saying that racial reconciliation is part of the gospel, and you would instead say racial reconciliation ought to be an effect of the gospel, 95% of your problem is going to disappear like that. And in a faculty meeting when Matthew Hall was being considered for promotion, there were three of us who spoke up against his promotion. Russell Fuller, Mark Coppinger, and myself. And uh, when, it was, uh, when it was my turn to speak, then I said, uh, Dr. Hall is saying that, that racial reconciliation is part of the gospel. And I said, and there is a certain way that that can be explained that I will agree with it. And so I had a private conversation with Dr. Hall and I asked him what I thought was a, an insightful diagnostic question. 
I said, do you even believe that J.P. Boyce is in heaven? Now, we had this conversation in an office when he was dean of Boyce College. And he had a portrait of J.P. Boyce in his office. I asked him, do you even believe that J.P. Boyce is in heaven? He said, I'm not the judge of J.P. Boyce. Now, I, I'm repeating this. I'm repeating this story in a, a, a faculty meeting that consisted of the full professors who are elected to the faculty. So there were 31 of us in there. And this is, uh, this is supposed to be the kind of the inside governing body of the seminary. At least that's the way that it's touted. <clears throat> and so I'm relating this. I, I asked him, do you even believe that J.P. Boyce is in heaven? And he answered, I'm not the judge of J.P. Boyce. And so I said, well, let me ask you these, these three questions. What is heresy? He said, heresy is damnable doctrine. I said, is racism heresy? He said, yes, it is. I said, was J.P. Boyce a racist? He said, yes, he was. I said, well, you won't come right out and say it. But you don't believe that J.P. Boyce is in heaven because he, was, he, does, he doesn't agree with your perspective on racism. And he said, well, I don't know about Boyce and Broadus, but I have no confidence at all about Thornwell and Dabney. I just don't think that they are in heaven at all. Now that, at the time, was a fairly popular worldly view to have. If anybody was associated with slavery in the past, if anyone was associated with the Old South, let's tear down their statues, let's get rid of their influence as much as we can. I maintain that that is an effort to court the favor of the world. I'll probably say this again tomorrow. The Bible does not have one word to say about racial reconciliation outside of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Racial reconciliation, according to the Bible, is to take place because we are so enthralled with the glory of Jesus Christ that we forget to care about these lesser issues. But I'll hopefully save some of that for tomorrow. So the first, the first thing that I'm saying is that there, there is a longing for people who are in theological academics to be approved by the world. Another idea that, uh, that creeps in is that we really need to make money. We have really got to make money. And, uh, you know, in, in the case of uh, a big... A big seminary like, like Southern Seminary, like Southwestern, like Midwestern, those guys have multi-million dollar budgets. And the cooperative program, of course, doesn't, doesn't cover even the majority of it. Uh, they, in their, in their purpose statement, will say we are servants of the churches of the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. And our purpose is to prepare men and women for better service in the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, but the Southern Baptist Convention does not pay the majority of the bill. They've got to attract students. And they've got to pay for the students once they get there. And so raising money becomes a really big deal. I understand that. Uh, thank God that there are wealthy people and faithful poor people who, who support the work of the Lord. And some people give directly to the seminary. But I think that it, it can cause us to compromise uh, in a couple of areas. For one, when it, when, you can't serve God and money. So that's the big thing. You cannot serve God and money. And so when, when the main goal becomes, how can we get enough money to keep this thing rolling, then anything that interferes with that is thought to be a distraction, and, uh, and we'd better sideline it. I'm afraid that the gospel, in all of its rugged beauty, often falls into that category. So... At, uh, at Southern Seminary, they put hundreds of thousands of dollars into recruiting students. I have heard the figure, uh, uh, I can't remember, it's 12000 maybe $17,000 is invested in getting each student to come. And so once they get there, then there is enormous effort to, to retain them. And so there are all these uh, wonderful facilities. There's a there's a fall festival that they put on that I don't know what the budget is for that thing, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, uh, 
and we, we want to provide a nice environment for our students to enjoy. I have no problem with that as long as it doesn't distract from the main thing and we become a money-making machine. One of the evidences that I fear, and this is specific to Southern Seminary, is, well, I'll just tell you, uh, before, I, before I got fired, a, a year or two before I got fired, Matthew Hall, who was my dean at the time, came into a faculty meeting and he said, the, the tuition discount is now going to be offered to students who come from, from Southeastern Christian Church. So in case you don't know, if you, if you are a member of a, a Southern Baptist Church, when you go to Boyce College or when you go to Southern Seminary, and I assume it's true of the other five seminaries as well, half of your tuition is paid for by the cooperative program. So it's a great deal. Uh, you can go to a Southern Baptist Seminary for a, a fraction of what you would pay at you know, say at, at Trinity or at Dallas, and I, I don't know what the situation is at Masters. But uh, prob it's probably true. It just takes a lot of money, uh, and, but, the, but, but it's subsidized by the cooperative program, and Southern Baptist students can go there for, for half price. And so he comes in, he announces students from South, Southeastern Christian Church. Are you hearing me? This is, this is the disciples of Alexander Campbell. This is people who believe that you've got to be baptized in order to be saved. When he announced that, within the next few days, I spoke to Greg Wills, who at that time was the dean of the School of Theology. I spoke to Adam Greenway, who at that time was the dean of the Billy Graham School. And in on this conversation was also Randy Stinson, who at that time was provost. None of those guys are there anymore. They've all moved on to something else. And I said, why are, we giving the, why are we giving the tuition discount to people who preach a false gospel? They said, well, they, they don't preach uh, baptismal regeneration anymore. I said, go to their website. Look at the videos. Look at the videos that they post about baptism. Listen to the sermons that they preach about baptism. Read their confession of faith. They hold to baptismal regeneration. They said, well, this was a decision that Dr. Moeller made. I know why he made the decision. Because probably the most generous donors in Louisville to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary are from Southeast Baptist Church. <laughs> Southeast Christian Church, Southeast Christian Church. There are wonderful people from Southeast who come to chapel. They're there, all, they're there more than the profs. They come to chapel and they give generously to the seminary. I wrote Dr. Moeller a letter about this after I was fired and, uh, and you know, expressing my protest. If you don't like it, you should write him a letter of protest too. And uh, he said, well, their tuition is paid for by Southeast. Now, of course, I've got a lot of friends who are still on faculty and in, the, in various administrative offices, and I don't want to get this guy fired, so I'm not going to say his name, and I'm going to try not to say how he knows so much. But he knows the answer to this question. I asked him, is there a separate fund that is set apart by and paid for by Southeast Christian Church to pay for the tuition discount of these students. And he said, not that I'm aware of. And he would be aware of it if it was there. So I, I would like to put the best possible construction that I can on Al Mohler's answer to me, and that what he really meant was, people from Southeast give so much money that that money would cover the tuition discount. I want it kept separate. I don't want it to be all mingled up. I don't want to pay for the ministry education of people who are going to go out and preach that you've got to be baptized in order to be saved. But that sort of thing happens when you start courting money. When you want the favor and the approval of the world, then that sort of thing happens. 
Now let's move on and talk for a bit about personnel. Once, once a worldly perspective towards ed theological education gets implanted, oh, I forgot to mention something, but I've just got to go back. I forgot to mention something. So another, another evidence of the fact that getting money is a major consideration at our theological institutions is the unbelievable emphasis that is now put on internet education. Now, let me say as a disclaimer here that I am currently involved in an educational endeavor that involves my teaching over the internet. Uh, and I am teaching to students who are in a closed country and every other week there are more than 100 students tuning in in a country where they will get in big trouble if they get caught. And so I think that there is a place for internet education. But here's my, here's a history of my protests against internet education. I'll cut out part of it. So when, uh, in about 2016, 2017, we at Southern Seminary began selling more hours online than we did on campus, and Dr. Moeller put out a, a plan for the future that included pushing internet education even more, then I stood up in the faculty meeting and I said, Dr. Moeller, I am opposed to our continuing to push internet education. Internet education gives the impression that the primary component of a theological education is the acquisition of information. When in fact, the primary component of a theological education is the formation of character. And that character formation almost cannot take place through an internet format. And then there were several guys in the room who said, well, I don't know, I'm able to have an influence on my students and I'm able to do this on my internet students. And uh, Dr. Moeller grew red in the face. I assume he was angry with me. And, uh, and he said, well, what would you have us to do, Dr. Oreck? I said, well, if it was up to me, I'd make the whole thing disappear. I said, look, internet, online education is not good for the student, it's not good for the churches, and it's not good for the kingdom. I said, you're the most respected voice in theological education. We're the most respected school in theological education. Let's take the high road. And then he said to me what I heard so many other times, well, if we do that, then you're going to be looking for a job. Because internet education is one of the primary, primary ways that the seminary is funded now. In addition to undergraduate schools, have you wondered why all the seminaries have got undergraduate schools now? It's because those undergraduate schools are paying for the seminaries. People don't feel like they've got to go to seminary in person to get a good seminary education, but most parents still feel like their students need to go to a physical campus, and the way they really make their money is on-campus students who are paying for housing and for the meal plan. And so they really push that. There's good that comes out of it. I'm not complaining about that. I worked there for 18 years. I don't think it's totally down the tubes. Dr. Moeller, in, a, in an incredible act of grace, extended the tuition discount to my daughter, even though I haven't worked there for two years, and says she can go to school there free until she graduates. So if you ask me, is, is Southern Seminary totally down the tubes? Is Boyce College down the tubes? No. There are a lot of good people there. There are good people in the administration. There are good men and women who teach on the faculty. I'll criticize them in just a minute, but let me just get that big and plain. If I thought that it was a total cesspool, I wouldn't let my daughter go there, whether it was free or not. But it really is a great incentive that it is free. And I talk to her about who have you got in class. And she talks to me about who she's got in class. And uh, I have maybe 20 or 25 uh, students from the college and the seminary who attend the Bullet Lick Baptist Church and are members of the Bullet Lick Baptist Church. I mentor uh, eight to 12 of these young men who are preparing for ministry. And um, 
Some of them are pastoral interns. I talk to them about who they're taking. They talk to me about who they're taking. If you send your kids to any theological school, you need to be involved. You need to be talking to them. You don't want them to go there and get and, uh, and embrace philosophies and ideas that are, are counter to the gospel. And they are there. Now, uh, in the administration, once, once the idea becomes we're going to please the world and we're going to make money, no matter what it costs, then the people who start hiring administrators look for someone who is a CEO rather than someone who is a Holy Spirit-filled man. And when it becomes obvious after the passage of years that an administrator is no longer a Spirit-filled man, he will keep his job as long as he doesn't do something really stupid. Uh, Okay, I'm not going to call any names here. But here's what, here's what we need to ask. Does this man bear the fruits of the Spirit? This church, this church in Sardis, Jesus said to them, I know your works. You have the reputation for being alive, but you're dead. And I think that that is the case with some of the people who are in administration and faculty positions at our Southern Baptist seminaries. Do they bear the fruits of the Spirit? So you just pick yourself one, one that you know, and ask this. Does he have love? Does he have joy? Does he have peace? Is he a patient man? Is he kind? Is he gentle? Is he faithful? Does he manifest self-control? And I can think of administrators that I know at Southern Seminary that I have to say, are you out of your mind? The answer to all those questions is no. Anyone who is around this person for any length of time will see that he, he throws pouty fits. We'll see that he gets angry. We'll see that he rules by intimidation. He rules by threats. And the influence filters down. I'm very concerned about, uh, about the administration and the faculty. I, I'm, I can still say that most of them are good men. Uh, but I'll say this. Has it ever puzzled you as to why so few academic professors can preach? They're almost non-existent. Now, we can think of exceptions to that. I can think of exceptions to that at, at Southern Seminary and, and could name them. Uh, some guys that are serious about academics and they can also preach, but they are pretty rare. You ever wonder why that is? If you're going to be a preacher with any power, you have got to spend a lot of time in prayer and meditation and Bible study. If you're going to do more than just tell stories and entertain people, if you're going to have Holy Spirit power, it takes time. Academics are very busy. And in addition to all the busyness that academics have always had, now there's the distraction of social media. And some of these guys are spending hours a day on social media. No doubt about it. No, no doubt about it. How could they else send out tens of thousands of tweets? How could they else post two or three times a day on Facebook? And I, and I, don't, I don't know what else. I, I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty out of the loop when it comes to technology. And uh, that, that I probably should have included that in the, in the disclaimer. I don't, I don't try to keep up with everything that is happening in the Southern Baptist Convention. I don't try to keep up with everything that is happening in the evangelical world. Dr. Moeller would come into faculty meetings and start talking about stuff that was going on. And sometimes I would ask him, I don't, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I thought about just getting a little five by seven card and putting a big question mark on it and telling him when he's, you start talking about something, I'm just going to hold this little question mark up. I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't have time for that. I don't think I'm frantically busy. 
But I sure don't want to cram all this social media stuff in there. But let me tell you, the faculty that I know are heavily engaged in things that take up their time. Remember this, the thing that you do, choose, the thing that you choose to do crowds out the thing that you might have done. Whether for better or for worse, the thing that you choose to do crowds out the thing that you might have done. And if you choose to spend several hours a day uh, fiddling with social media, you don't get extra hours on the day. It's crowded out something else that you might do. I find it disconcerting that so few academics can preach. Okay, but I grant that God gives different gifts to different people. And there are some people who are just not gifted with the gift to preach. Here's what gripes me. So few professional theological academics can teach well. Just talk to your students. Just talk to the people who have been to seminary there. Talk to the people who go to college there. I have been in touch with this for years and years, and I'm just, I'm just sick at the, the way that these professors will sit there and, and allow the whole class to be on their cell phone, not paying a bit of attention. But who could pay attention to that, I wonder? If you want your sermon to move me, it had better move you first. If you want your lesson to engage me, it had better engage you first. I had a rule in my class, no cell phones. If I saw a student pull out a cell phone, I'd say, what are you doing on that cell phone? Uh, I'm sending a text. So I want you to take your books, get out of this classroom, and you and I, you're not going to be able to get back until you and I have a conversation with one another with the dean or whoever, whoever was the sheriff in those days. Boy, uh, rumor would go through the school like that. Don't get your cell phone out in Dr. Oreck's class, man. He will call you out. But I would tell them, look, I took a pay cut to come to Southern Seminary. I take a pay cut every year that I stay here. I'm not here for the money. I'm here because I believe that what I'm talking about matters. And it is insulting for somebody to get out their cell phone and start texting when I'm talking about life and blood issues. There's no excuse for a man persistently being a bad preacher if he's called to preach. Do the work that is necessary to become a better preacher. There's no excuse for somebody being a bad teacher if he's called to teach. Do the work that is necessary to be a prepared, on-time, engaged teacher. But this is a problem. It takes effort to do that. They can't preach, they can't teach, and boy, oh boy, does it gripe me that they can't listen. That they can't listen in chapel is what I'm talking about. Now, a few of you here have told me that you attended Southern, and if you went to chapel, then you may have noticed that for during your academic career, I probably sat apart from the chapel, apart from the faculty. Uh, my idea was, uh, I'm here to worship the Lord. I'm not here to fraternize with my friends. In the, towards the end of my career, I felt like that, was, that seemed kind of unnecessarily separatist. And so I went ahead and I sat with the faculty, not like I'm doing them some big favor or anything like that. The reason that I sat apart from them was because I knew how distracted they all were. And it was confirmed when I went and sat among them. Most of them will play on their cell phones while the sermon is going on. Most of them will be playing on their iPads while the sermon is going on. Now, you know, it's kind of tricky these days because people have their Bibles on their phones and they have their people there. So I'm not talking about that, that person who may have been consulting the Greek text or the Hebrew text on his iPad. I'm talking about that guy who was sending out tweets the whole time. I'm talking about that guy. And it's not just the faculty. I mean, it would real. And I, I sent letters to the administration about this. I, I've got record of almost all the controversies that took place between me and the administration for the, the last years of my career there. I sent letters saying, don't you know that students are looking at you trying to determine how they're supposed to act in worship? 
and you have the audacity to say that we are in the presence of God and you sit there and play on your cell phone the whole time. That's the sort of thing that will get you fired. I remember uh, when I was on a mission trip one time and there was a, uh, a pastor who was from Korea. He was old enough that he had lived in North Korea at the time of the communist takeover. He was just a boy when it happened. But he said that one day he was in service. He was Presbyterian. He said, one day I was in service with my, my parents and a man came into the service and whispered something in the ear of my father. My father nodded that he had heard and he sat there where he was until the service was over. And what the man had come and whispered to his father was, your house is on fire. But my father respected the presence of God in public worship so much that he would not disrupt the service to go put out a fire at his own house. And it burned to the ground. I'd say that that father probably has a pretty good place to live now. Because he respected God. Look, I've already told you I'm, I'm not in, I never even had a cell phone until I became a full-time pastor again after I got fired. And I don't, I don't keep it turned on. And, uh, and, and, I, and I almost never use it. So I've already told you I'm not into all this technology. It's going to be the death of your spiritual life if you don't get it under control. Anyway, we're talking about challenges at the seminary. And uh, here's a problem. They're not even good listeners, but here is another problem. Most of these good men are not very brave. And that's a way of saying they're cowards. I hate to put it so bluntly. As evidence of that, I, I, I told you earlier that at the faculty meeting where someone who's whose dedication to the gospel was suspicious. When he was under consideration for promotion, Russell Fuller, Mark Coppinger, and I spoke up against him. Now, there was a secret vote that was taken at the end of that, and um, more than 25% of the full professors elected to the faculty voted no when it was a secret ballot. I said to Dr. Moeller, someone needs to talk to Dr. Hall about this, and it doesn't need to be me when he is presented for election to the faculty this afternoon. Dr. Moeller said, well, he's not going to be presented for election to the faculty this afternoon. And so Russell Fuller, who was uh, an outspoken opponent of Matt Hall's advancement, went home. He was on sabbatical, so he came to the full profs meeting, and then he went home. I think that if Russell Fuller had been there, then the story that I'm about to tell you would have turned out slightly better. That afternoon, when Dr. Hall was presented for election to the faculty, for the first time in 17 years, I was there for another year, but for the first time in 17 years, the vote on whether or not to elect someone to the faculty at the recommendation of the faculty was not taken secretly. It was taken orally. All in favor of recommending Dr. Hall to be elected to the faculty say yes. Everybody says yes. All opposed say no. And there was only one person who said no. And I didn't whisper it either. I voted no. I know where Russell Fuller was. Where were the other six? Where were the other six? Well, I, I know what they were concerned about. They were concerned about the same thing that the man who was supposed to be standing here right now was concerned about. And that is that if he does anything contrary to the administration, he's going to lose his job. That's what they all were thinking. So they all stayed quiet. When they started breathing down my neck about this and that, uh, there was a young man on the faculty that I had mentored very capable young man. He's a wonderful, talented teacher. He came into my office and he said, Jim, I want you to know that I will stand with you as long as it doesn't cost me my job. And I called him by name and I said, that's the way cowards talk. 
And then I quoted to him these few lines. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. Some great cause, some great decision, offering each the bloom or blight. And the choice goes by forever betwixt that darkness and that light. Then it is the brave man chooses while the coward stands aside. Till the multitude make virtue of the faith they had denied. And then I love this part of the poem. Though the cause of evil prosper, yet the truth alone is strong. Though her portion be the scaffold, and upon the throne be wrong, yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. God is looking for men who are willing to stand in the gap. God is looking for women who are willing to stand in the gap. People who are willing to say, there are some things that are worth, worth losing your job over. But I think one of the challenges that faces academic institutions of theology again and again is that we have some good men who do not have a spine. Now I'm going to bring this to a conclusion because I know that my time is, uh, is past. I'm going to bring this to a conclusion. So I've talked about ideas, I've talked about personnel, and now I'm going to talk for just a bit about churches and the responsibility of churches, especially in the Southern Baptist Convention. Our seminaries are allegedly under the direction of the churches. And the way that that is supposed to work is that we uh, elect a president who will then appoint trustees to serve in that seminary. And there are times when that has been effective. That is the way that the Southern Baptist seminaries were reclaimed during the conservative resurgence. But now there is a status among the trustees, I'll say it Southern, they are in open-mouthed, jaw-dropping awe of Southern Seminary and Al Mohler and the fact that they get to be there. They are not going to oppose Al Mohler. As far as I know, there's only one seminary who will stand up to Al Mohler, and that's Tom Rush. But Tom Rush has, on several occasions, spoken up against things. Tom, when they fired Russell Fuller and me, and we never signed the non-disparagement agreement, they said, well, then we're not going to pay you your last two months of salary. Now, we had already fulfilled our contractual obligations for the year. Russell Fuller was on sabbatical. I had already taught all the classes that I was contracted to teach. If I had remained on faculty and I'd done nothing but bass fish the rest of the summer, they would have paid me for those two months. It's just understood. That's my money. But they said, well, as an incentive to try and get you to sign the non-disparagement agreement, we will uh, we'll pay you all the way through the, the contract year. Now, anybody... Now, they've probably got some kind of legal loophole where that if Moeller or Hall or any of the administrators hear this, they'll say, yeah, but legally we weren't obligated to. All right. Maybe that's the case. Morally, you were. Morally, you were. So Tom Rush takes this to the trustees and he says, obviously, they never fired these guys because of COVID. They hired new people before the summer was out. Uh, and, you know, they, you, they, Dr. Moeller told the trustees, these guys are not producing academically. They're not good teachers. And uh, I, I would address that, but uh, it would not be uh, keeping with humility for me to do so. And so Tom Rush brings this up to the trustees. We need to pay these guys the thousands of dollars that we owe them. They wouldn't even bring it to the floor. And so the system of trustees being the emissaries of the churches is not working at Southern. I wonder how it works at other places. I understand that Al Mohler is an august figure 
and that uh, it, it is a little awe-inspiring to be around someone that you have seen on TV and you've read his books and you've heard his, his podcasts and so on. And then all of a sudden, here you are in his presence. And so I think that this is an instance where you people, the people who hear this on the internet, who are pastors of churches, who are members of churches, send letters. I think that probably writing a letter with pen and ink is the most effective way to do it. We don't like it that you have allowed these professors who have espoused critical race theory and said that Christians ought to read the writings of James Cone and people who have posted on their blog sites that John Broadus and J.P. Boyce were good men, but they were heretics, that you allow these guys to stay on faculty. Well, they've denied that they hold a critical race theory. And I tell you what you've got to do. You've got to find some of these quotations and say, Dr. Hall, are you still finding the rotting corpse of, of uh, white supremacy beneath all these veneers of orthodoxy? Dr. Hall, are you still proud to be an, a proponent of critical race theory and social justice? Uh, do you still think that all men, all white men over the age of 45 are prejudiced, like you said in one of these meetings one time? You still hold to that? You see, it's not enough to ask, do you still hold to critical race theory? They're going to say, no, I don't, and I never did. Do you believe in reparations? Do you believe in a forcible redistribution of wealth? Apparently, Al Mohler does, because within the last three or four years, he designated $5 million for scholarship money for one particular ethnic group. And I can tell you, it's not Koreans. Because that would probably cause a stir. It's not for people from Switzerland or people who come from Scotland. I'm not exactly sure how they determine who is eligible for this for this scholarship money. Can someone just show up and say, I belong to this ethnic group? Do you ask them to provide some kind of genetic proof that they indeed do? Is it just a matter of skin tone? Is it just a matter of hair texture? Is that what gets you this scholarship money? I wrote to Dr. Moeller and I said, giving this scholarship money to an ethnic group is contrary to the gospel. The gospel that says in Christ there is no Jew or Greek or slave or free or male and female. Female, We are all one in Christ Jesus. Have there been mistakes made in that regard in the past? Yes. Perpetuating the mistake on the other side does not make it right. Now look. I, I don't care if the Pope pays for somebody's education. I just don't want my cooperative program dollars going towards ethno-specific scholarship money. I don't, want my scholars, I don't want my cooperative program dollars going towards the education of people who say up front that you've got to be baptized in order to be saved. Churches have got to step up. Pastors have got to step up. Don't be a spineless coward. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who holds the seven stars, who has the seven spirits of God. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it. And repent. If not, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have a few names in Sardis. People who have not soiled their garments. And they will walk with me in white. For they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has ears to hear, 
Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches.